recently completed her PhD in the English department at King's College London, uh, funded by Anid Becas Chile. And she's been researching early modern poetics, literary theory, reception mm -hmm. studies, book history, which is fascinating. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Um, rhetoric, multilingualism, and cross period experimental literature. Um, her doctoral research uh, specifically explored the reception of Hermógenes of Tarsus uh, on ideas of style um, in the innovative verse of Shakespeare and his contemporaries. And her thesis has been nominated to King's College London Outstanding Thesis Prize 2022. Mm -hmm. So congratulations for that. Thank you, Fran. Um, so, all right. Take us, take us into your world of all of these exciting ideas. And please, if you have any questions, you can write them down in the chat. I think you can also write them down in the chat via um, YouTube. Um, that, that, those are my options, I think. Or you can also, obviously, after the, after the mm -hmm. presentation is over, um, we'll open the microphone for questions, all right? So thank you so much, Javiera, for being with us. Brilliant. Um... Well, we have a presentation somewhere yes, there so that we might share. Um, but yeah, first of all, I wanted to thank you, Fran, for having me here. Uh, we're in Fran's house, so she's hosting me. And thank you so much <laughs> as well uh, for uh, inviting me to this ongoing seminar. Super, super honored. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Centro Extensión, Blenny, and also to all the audience that's here today. I am really, really pleased to be at my former university uh, since, as Fran said, I did my undergrad in Hispanic American and, lit and Latin American literature rather than English, but we can talk a little bit about that later, how I ended up in English poetry and, and basically combining both topics. So um, the talk I'm gonna be giving today is strongly focused on, uh, on showing you some of the outcomes of my doctoral research. And what did I do for my PhD? I studied the influence, the reception of a Greek author called Hermogenes of Tarsus in the poetry and this author lived in the second century AD, so very old classical Greek author, in the poetry written by Shakespeare and his contemporaries, let's say 16th, 17th century literature in England. So the first thing you might ask me when you hear about this topic is, who is Hermogenes, right? We have never heard about him. We, it's not a familiar name, for example, in the very same way in which Aristotle or, or Plato are familiar names to us, even though we might have not read about uh, their theories like directly in a book, right? We know they were massively influential in literature of all times. And the answer to this is that actually Hermogenes was indeed this sort of author in the Renaissance. His work was massively read uh, and used in a similar scale probably than Aristotle's rhetoric and influenced groundbreaking literary developments of the period. Mostly and more especially the sort of mixed, obscure, witty literature that later critics have called metaphysical or Baroque. So that was the main contention of my thesis. Um, and in writing it, what I tried to do, oh, and here I might start sharing. I'll show you. Yeah. So that's the drawings are mine. This is the thing I'm most proud of. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to pin this so I can see the presentation. Brilliant. Uh, so, yeah. So, what I did in my thesis was actually to articulate two different moments of time, right? The second century AD, when the writings uh, that have been attributed to Hermogenes were composed, uh, but then how these writings were edited, translated, circulated, owned, and finally used to read and write poetry in the 16th and 17th centuries. But what I want to do today, and this is a new thing, so I'm going to ask you to bear with me because this is new material and thinking, is to add a third time coordinate to the equation and geographical coordinate too, uh, by means of asking, well, if I think that Shakespeare can and should be read from Hermogenes uh, theory of language and style, what like if is it possible to do the same thing with a later author that read Shakespeare a lot and that was really influenced by his poetry, such as Nicanor Parra? Nicanor Parra, my Chilean and Latin American audiences will know, was a very influential uh, Chilean author that coined the anti-poetry that was really influential in the second half of the 20th century. Hugely, hugely well-known author. And he read Shakespeare, he read Shakespeare a lot uh, and throughout his life. So can we read 
the uh, anti or the satirical poetics of these three authors together? And if we do, what's the methodological implications and, of doing this? And what is the future avenues of research that this opens up? So that's some of the kind of inquiries I'm gonna be presenting to you today. Um, this is quite explorative, so all feedback will be really welcome. So what I have done in order to kind of put these thoughts together is to organize this talk in three parts that I don't know if they're gonna make a lot of sense at the beginning, but I hope to tie everything up at the uh, at the end of the of the talk. They are called Found Books, Greek Styles, and Verso Blanco. So off we go. Found books. In which books do we encounter our books? In this essay, I wish to talk about some specific type of widespread, enormously influential literary works, such as those written by Hermogenes, Shakespeare, and Parra. These are works which, being so integrated in our pedagogical literary culture, and are not read solely in books by their author, but also found in a variety of other books, books that quote them, translate them, use them, discuss them, and even bluntly integrate them without naming their sources. These are works that we today encounter through a variety of media and context, the lines of an ad, a mainstream movie, blogs and tweets, ebooks, and of course, books of a variety of materials and formats. Crucially, many of the contexts in which we find these books are institutional. I'm thinking specifically of the literature we encountered at school and universities. For example, I doubt that many of us read Pablo Neruda, Gabriela Mistral, or in the case of the English audience or British audience, uh, Shakespeare, for the first time in a book by Neruda or Mistral or Shakespeare, rather than, for example, in a school textbook with some specific guidance on how to read its prosody, form, and meaning. These places of encounter of the literary tradition involve not only textbooks we, we read at school, but also for many of us in this talk today, the material we encountered at university, including PDFs, photocopies, handbooks, and classes themselves, maybe I'm looking to all that naming this, uh, this media, right? According to these logics, these works are so widespread that they shape informal education too. Books that conform the underlying stock, nurturing the literary preconceptions that inform poetic practice of the present. The 20th century Chilean poet Nicanor Parra gives a good example of these aspects of textual transmission and the material and institutional places of literary perception of the classics. In one of the books that he published when being a lot, an already well-recognized author, News from Nowhere from 1975, he reproduced in between his own experimental verse a mysterious piece, which he titled Found Poem, Poem Encontrado, without naming its author. The text was, as a matter of fact, a poem by one of the authors that most influenced him throughout his life, William Shakespeare. Shakespeare's famous sonnet 18, Shall I Compare Thee to a Summer's Day, celebrated the long-lived legacies of literature, as its speaker promised their lover immortality through verse, with the closing lines, so long as men, as men can breathe or like eyes can see, so long lives this and this gives life to thee. Parra's titling of the poem, Poema Encontrado, is on the one hand a reference to Chan's found objects and his allegation that it is a gesture what gives these objects the status of a work of art. However, I want to suggest here that this, this title also implies that the poem is about the material places where Parra has found his books. Parra does not quote Shakespeare's name, but he signals a series of clues that will help his avid reader to discover the poem's provenance. First, he incorporates below the sonnet with a tiny font that you can see below there, Descubierto <laughs> in the Oxford Book of English Verse. As you can see, this is the only clue that we have that this is a Spanish speaker that discovers the English tradition, like because this is written in Spanish. The anthology is, as a matter of fact, one of the most influential collections of English verse in its whole history. This is the book uh, that I am, in fact, holding in my hands right now. I'm going to show it to you here in the screen. So the edition I have here is from 1922, but what I'm showing you in the screen is the edition from 1900s, which was the first time when it was published. And the anthology at the uh, so it was published by Oxford University Press, edited by Arthur Quiller Couch, and it sold my, more than 500,000 copies in this first edition, and this was only the beginning. The book had been abundantly reprinted thereafter, and enlarged by its editor in 1939. 
which is the copy that probably uh, Parra had uh, for reasons I'm gonna explain later. In fact, the copy I have was printed in no less than 12 cities, including London, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Copenhagen, New York, Toronto, Melbourne, Cape Town, Bombay, Calcutta, Madras, and Shanghai. So, uh, incredibly disseminated copy, right? As you will see, this is a small snapca, uh, knapsack edition. While the number of authors it included was remarkable, his editor, Arthur Quiller Couch, privileged the inclusion of a wide range of poems rather than many poems per author, meaning that the readers could find here some prominent names which would help them in their own subsequent explorations of the English literary tradition. Quiller Couch, in fact, claims that, and I quote him, for this anthology I have tried to range over the whole field of English verse, which is a large endeavor, right? From the beginning or from the 13th century to this closing year of the 19th, end of quote. Parra's found poem is on page, page 190, alongside other sonnets and parliaments by Shakespeare and verse by John Donne, William Blake, Robert Browning, Edgar Allan Poe, amongst many, many more. The enormously widespread circulation of the anthology means that Parra's found poem was, as a matter of fact, not that difficult to find, mm -hmm. and that Shakespeare's sonnets in Quiller Cout's specific version had reached much wider international readerships, held by the global reach of English as a lingua franca and the prestige of Oxford University Press. This is not only in the islands for Marconolis, uh, but also in Latin America. To give you an idea, this is a book that you can find easily in Mercado Libre, for example, even though it's outrageously priced, like Cien mil pesos. Uh, well, here was a bit cheaper to get. Um, so where did Parra find the anthology? It is almost certain that he did at the University of, of Oxford, where he traveled to study a PhD in cosmology in 1949. I would say certainly, since it included all the authors and individual poems that Parra endearingly spills about when talking about his first encounter with the English Renaissance tradition when he was studying over there. Though he never got his PhD at the end and he really struggled with English weather and seems according <laughs> to him that he spent all his time reading books of English poetry rather than books in mathematics which was why he never uh, made it at the end. These authors in, of course include Shakespeare, I'm going to show a bit more here, but also John Donne, who was also included in the anthology, the author that John Dryden baptized as a metaphysical poet because of his indecorous blending of love and philosophy and of the way in which his poetry, and I'm going to quote him here, joked by violence the most heter heterogeneous ideas together. End of quote. Parra specifically recounts John Donne's religious sonnet, Define Death, a, a sonnet that is in all of Donne's anthologies, right? Um, with its forceful, forceful opening line, death be not proud, and its compelling argument that death, however omnipotent, is finally power, powerless over us, since it dies in the, in the very moment that it takes us. Parra recounts understanding only then what real poet, poethood had to be like, adding that, and I quote him now, only then I realized the potential of English poetry in relationship to Hispanic American. All of this read in Quiller Couch's anthology. Quite remarkably, Parra discovered something that appeared to be a similar attitude towards death in both cultures, but also, I think, the unimpertinent and dissenting vein of the anti-poet, his defiance to and laugh of even the most powerful and omnipotent of addresses, what in his Quebranta Huesos he described as no dejar titere con cabeza. What is fascinating about these first encounters with English poetry in Quiller Couch's anthology is that they are quite coincident with the birth of this anti-poetry as a project. It was during these years in England when Parra composed his groundbreaking and second book, Poemas y Antipoemas, crafting the sardonic, harsh, witty speaker that Chilean readerships today recognize as the fingerprint of his verse. As Revista Que Pasa says in an article of 20, 2002, Parra would go to England as a poet and return as an anti-poet. Poemas y Antipoemas, which is arguably a milestone in all Latin American poetry of the second half of the 20th century, was saturated with references to the English poetry that Parra read in Oxford, especially Shakespeare, including a veiled translation of Hamlet's soliloquy and a poem titled Preguntas a la hora del té. Poemas y Antipoemas does signals a connection between Parra's anti-poetry and the English Renaissance tradition from its very foundations, a connection that was to interest Parra throughout his life to the point that he eventually defined this type of poetry as a form of, and I quote him, Shakespearean blank verse, verso blanco Shakespearean. 
In including his found poem among his now more mature antipoetic verse, Parra is precisely signposting the affinity of those projects and the comfortable sitting of Shakespeare's verse among his own. Parra's found poem, however, did not only signal Quiller Couch's anthology as the only source where he found his poem. His poem and Contrado located Shakespeare, uh, Shakespeare's sonnet alongside two different numbers, 155, which is his numbering in the anthology from 1939 edition, which is the one I don't have, so that's why you have the other number over there. Uh, but also 18, which is his, his appearance in the first printed edition of Shakespeare's sonnets in 1609. Parra does suggest that he has found the poem in different books and in different moments of his life, arguably that he has moved from reading it in the anthology to later look for it, and I put this in between asterisks, original source. This is the first printed source, including William Shakespeare in the title page. Something quite similar to what we may have done in discovering the classics that have caught our eye. Barra's found poem thus gives us an insight on the poem's relationship with Shakespeare and ultimately with his classics, a bilingual, critical, flexible reading of his poem alongside a network of other Anglophone sources, a reading shaped within the educational and editorial umbrella of Oxford where he studied and which was about to transform his subsequent poetic practice. That was the first part. Now, second part, Greek styles. It's like a lot of PhD here. Mm -hmm. Greek styles. Parra, in reading Shakespeare, traveled to the past, and by including it in his own poetics, he made his work current. Shakespeare and his contemporaries, it is well known, were pretty much doing the same thing. It has been well described in copious books of literary and intellectual history that the Renaissance was precisely a time of rediscovery of works, especially from classical Greek. Greece and Rome. These works generated a considerable excitement and a remarkable and remarkable efforts of translation, edition, interpretation, and subsequent literary, literary imitation, defining the period stock of literary themes, standards of poetic excellence, and generic decorum. Hermogenes of Tarsus was one of these authors of the past that was eagerly rediscovered. His work composed in the second century AD, included a, a little theatrist called On Ideas of Style that became widely influential in the Renaissance, transforming ideas of literature, genre, and style in the period, or at least is what I argued in my thesis. The theatrist was first reintroduced in, in Europe in the 15th century by hand of the Greek emigres that traveled to Italy after the fall of the Byzantine Empire, where Hermogenes' work dominated rhetorical training. Recognizing its importance, Renaissance scholars prescribed his work as central to education in European universities. This was also the case in England, where Hermogenes was prescribed in Cambridge and Oxford from the mid 16th century, exactly in the same institutional domains where Parra found his English Renaissance poets for the first time. My research showed that records of book ownership, handwriting in individual copies, and the mention of relevant poets and educators imply that Hermogenes was actually taught at both universities from much before, as well as circulated amongst the circles of the inns of court uh, with whom Shakespeare was acquainted. In other words, that he was standardly part of the period's formal education and also informal readings. You may have noticed now that I'm speaking of two key terms which I want to explain, rhetoric and style. Rhetoric might have a pejorative connotation today related to the power of deceiving or conveying shallow meaning through words, but this was not the case in the Renaissance. Then, as a matter of fact, the art of speaking well or finding persuasive arguments was a major field of knowledge and was thought by humanists to be used at the service of theological and philosophical truth and also literary expression. Rhetor rhetoric would teach you how to come out with the subject of your speech, how to organize it, how to dress it with the appropriate expressions, how to deliver it to convince and communicate it more effectively. Amongst these subjects taught by rhetoric, style or elocutio was, in easy words, the subject studying how we say the things we say how to dress our speech. So we come away talking about the same subject matter, but the form in which we say things is gonna completely transform what the speech is doing over its addresses. And this is what Hermogenes studied. Hermogenes on ideas of style precisely addressed this issue, which was as pertinent to political oratory as it was to literature. One of the reasons why the theatrist was so influential to rhetorical education from the 15th to the late 17th centuries in Europe. So, 
What did Hermogenes' work on rhetoric and style say, and why was it so appealing in the Renaissance? In his book, Hermogenes outlined seven forms or ideas of style, which you can see in the screen now, including the ideas of clarity, grandeur, beauty, rapidity, character, verity, and force. These had in turn sub-ideas, such as vehemence or ingenuity. So you had here at least 20 forms of style. Think about how exciting it might be, for example, to uh, have the guidelines to compose the style of verity, right? What do I need to do? How do I need to deliver my speech if I want to sound really sincere and if I want to sound that I'm saying the truth? And Hermogenes would go and give you all the guidelines to compose this type of speeches. So it was a work that was incredibly exciting. Crucially, Hermogenes also pointed out that all these ideas could also be mixed, resulting on a copious and rich array of at least 20 forms to say the things we say. In this, Hermogenes' rich and complex theory was significantly different to the main theory of style that Renaissance authors first learned at school and early university education, which was uh, the theory of the three genres of style or genera di candy of the Latin canon, the say Cicero and Quintilian. This theory distinguished only three types of style, the grand, the middle, and the low style, very schematic and simple. The high style was defined, defined as an impressive arrangement of words, very passionate, full of tropes and figures that was put in the mouth of dignified characters such as kings, princes, and heroes, and related to genres such as epic or tragedy. The low style, on the other hand, was a simple everyday converse conversation register, but also the style associated to low characters and genres such as shepherds or pastoral or satire. And then you had very vaguely in between the middle style, which was not as ornate as the high or not as simple as the low, and was generally defined as an easy flowing style. And this was generally the style of lyric and song, also suitable uh, for ladies, of course, because you couldn't try to, yeah, think they could be that sophisticated to get to the grand style. Um, crucially, Renaissance discussions of these three styles typically point out that this should not be mixed. And this is why genres such as tragic comedy or epilion were so criticized. Mixing the high and the low could have generated an indecorous mixture that disrupted poetry's decorous representation of the social body, eroding the alleged moral and social benefits of poetry. Poetry, therefore, needed to stick with one single style, which had a strict correspondence to the topic addressed. Uh, and this is, for example, why Dryden calls Don a metaphysical poet, because he's basically, he's, ba he's writing love poetry, but instead of using the middle style of love poetry, he's using the high style and metaphysical concepts. And that's something that shouldn't be done, right? So that's why he's like, oh, he's using metaphysical poetry. It's like a uh, derogative vision. So Hermogenes' theory messed up with all this vision. Uh, since he pointed out that all styles could and should be mixed, like in the most excellent style of Homer epics, which included all styles and genres. And that, as a matter of fact, mixture was not only necessary, but also unavoidable, since it was impossible to find a single idea of style using the word in the work of any classical poet or rhetorician. Renaissance authors recognized this innovative stylistic principle and used it to legitimize the mixed poetics of genres such, such as tragic comedy or epilion. However, the value of Hermogenes theory was not only its flexible and disruptive conception of form, but also its useful and detailed guidelines. Indeed, the Latin manuals gave, gave little instructions on how to compose the high, the middle, and the low styles, giving wide room to interpretation. Instead, for each of the ideas, Hermogenes pointed out the themes, figures of thought, figures of speech, prosody, and also gave many examples, then making it quite easy to compare his ideas to pre-existing literary works and to compose new texts. So let's give an example of some of the ideas. Uh, how basically how Hermogenes uh, conceptualized them and how were used in, in, in literary, uh, literary practice in the Renaissance. Some of the most influential, not all of them, but some of the most influential of Hermogenes ideas were those that involved criticism, reproach and dissent, such as the ideas of vehemence and asperity. These two ideas that you can see in the screen were quite similar since both of them were aimed at reproof. However, they had a major difference and I'm gonna show 
how Hermogenes talks about these ideas. Asperity was the speech directed to an adversary higher in the hierarchy than the speaker, while vehemence was directed to an equal or to someone that is less important than the speaker. Therefore, Asperity always involves some, some attenuation of the criticism, such as the generalization of vices, the omission of identifiable names of individuals, disguise of criticism as praise, irony, dubitation, and ambiguity. Vehemence instead involved an open reproach in which nothing was softened. Its strategies therefore included open commands, interrogations, and the use of the ethics, which showcased the speaker's hierarchical superiority. Two characteristics about this style were particularly important. One of them, which I include here in the middle, was their use of metaphor. Hermogenes suggested that the diction of the two ideas should be metaphorical or topical and harsh in itself. Examples from the most tennis he added are, and I quote him, you carry your brains trodden down your heels, or you have been hamstrung and the like. In the Oratione Libri Septem, the Renaissance scholar Antonio Lull very, uh, very disseminated in England too, further explained that in order to create harshness, the translated term of the metaphor had to be unpleasant to the senses. Hermogenes specification then tended to suggest that it was this use of metaphorical language that was particularly important for the composition of the restrained speech of asperity. The visual potential of metaphor, if well and intelligently handled, was, that carried, was what carried the power of criticism. The idea of vehemence, on the other hand, involved not only this metaphorical language, harsh metaphorical language, but further techniques such as the use of newly coined words and compound epithets, which were harsh, harsh in both sound and sense, such as, and the example Hermogenes gives is yamb eater. Yamb eater is a cool example because yam, the yambic tradition in Greek poetry, is a, is a tradition of satirical uh, invective poetry. So if you are a yamb eater, you're the receiver of the yams uh, that someone else is sending you, right? The second crucial point is that the styles of reproof, uh, especially the open style of vehemence, manifested through rhythm, sound, and prosody. Hermogenes prescribed the use of short words and phrases, clashing consonants, and the combination of different metrical patterns, pointing out that, and I'm gonna finally quote Hermogenes here. In a harsh style, words should be put together in such a way that sounds clash and are dissimilar to those that precede and follow and form metrical patterns that are inconsistent so that there will be, there will be no hint of meter and no charm produced by the order of the words and no appearance of harmony. Renaissance scholars, precisely related this theater to metrical experimentation. The scholar Johann Storm, for example, remarked that this verse had to be formed, and I quote him, by mixing different feet with no particular logic to the point that the verse will no longer make sense. And this, I think, is really important. Renaissance commentators stress that in a style of vehemence and criticism, you stretch the language to its limits, right? Thus, the harsh reproof of the styles of asperity and vehemence was, or, or how to put it in another way, uh, Hermogenes didn't even uh, work with one style of criticism, but he decided two different styles of criticism and gave, gave all the detailed guidelines, which you had to consider in attention to uh, the power relationship between the players involved. So it was kind of really productive principle to apply and to read literary texts too. Let's provide an example for a play that was, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm quite important to Nicanor Parra, King Lear, uh, by William Shakespeare, which was staged on 16, uh, 1607. For those who do not know the play, uh, let us put the argument roughly in this way. In Becoming Old, King Lear divides his kingdom amongst two of his daughters, but he discovers afterwards that his daughters had less love for his father than for his inheritance, right? Indeed, after they have got their portion of the cake, they deny the, their father accommodation and shelter in their homes, leaving him at the mercy of a fierce storm and at risk of insanity. And I won't spoil it more, so you can go and read it. In focusing on these shifts of power relationships, the play is all about the fluctuations between asperity and vehemence. A character that sees it all through is the Earl of Kent, who is banished from the country when he advises Lear against his malicious daughters. But Kent is tenacious, and to protect the king, he disguises as a servant and offers to follow him without Lear realizing his true identity. In Act Two, he is sent by the king to deliver correspondence to one of his daughters and finds himself in front of Oswald, the servant of one of the malicious daughters, who has sent a letter first to discredit the king. So Oswald doesn't recognize Kent, who is still disguised as a servant, but Kent does and proceeds to liberally insult him. 
and the lines read like this. I have, in, I have included here the image of the quarto of Shakespeare's play. It says, Ken says, fellow, I know thee. Oswald says, what does do not, thou know me for? And Ken, Ken proceeds his beautiful speech. A knave, a rascal, an eater of broken meats, a base, proud, shallow, beggarly, three-suited, hundred pound, filthy, words-talking knave. A lily livered, action taking knave, a whoresome, glass gazing, super serviceable, finical rogue, one trunk inheriting slave, one that would be abode in a good in a way of good service and art nothing but the composition of a knave, beggar, coward, pander, and the son and the son of an heir of a mongrel bitch, one whom I will bid into clamorous winning if you denies, if thou denies the least syllable of thy addition. So here you have the full recipe for vehemence, right? Uh, including clashing sounds, harsh metaphorical language, and a variety of newly coined compound words, many of them, many of which Shakespeare uh, articulates for the first time. Vehemence manifests itself as an obsession over nomination, over saying names, and it's made possible precisely because of the power relationship be between the two characters is confused. Kent, maybe not too astutely, shows his real status by applying his full power of inve invective over Oswald, something that would have been indecorous if he had been a real servant. In other words, his vehemence uncovers him as a superior. This is also evident because of the sort of lively insults that he applies to Oswald, most of which relate to his social status. For example, eater of broken meats means that he feeds over some other people's leftovers. The same counts for worst talking knave, which alludes to the cheap wool stocking that only servants would use in opposition to the silk stockings uh, used by real gentlemen. Bear in mind that Kent's repetition of words here, such as knave and beggar, are, is by all means not a Shakespearean negligence, but it was prescribed by Hermogenes as a way to bring the speech closer to conversation, promoting the effect of sincerity. The speech disarray rhythm reinforces this, yet there are interesting prosodic choices here. The parliament is written in prose, as you can see in the, in the original version, well, in the quarto version, not the original version. Um, <laughs> let me see. Uh, so the parliament is written in prose, however, the first line suggests that it will start in a pentameter line. Well, this illusion is subsequently deauthorized since the following line's additive rhetoric expands or shortens the feat. There are moments in which this impression reemerges because of an insisting yambic accentual pattern in the speech. And in this sense, Oswald is a yamb eater of Kenzie's thoughts. <laughs> there is, I think, an allusion to this defective, oh, sorry, the parliament is in this sense verse which didn't quite make it to verse, an aborted form of verse. There is, I think, an allusion to this defective metrical stock of the speech in Kent's final remarks, when he points out that Oswald shouldn't deny one syllable of the addition. The speech smingling of verse and prose is specifically interesting in light of the remarks they made known by Hermogenes himself, but by a Renaissance commentator of him, the great educator Johann Sturm, who I just quote, uh, and who composed a book in which Renaissance readers were more likely to find Hermogenes that Samson's in Hermogenes himself, right? Sturm remarks on the way in which the styles of vehemence are difficult to pronounce, and even more than in them, the verse eventually, and I quote him, stops making sense. Uh, imply that the language uh, is harsh not only to his dramatic addressee, in this case, Oswald, but also on us, his readers, a style that asks his readers to bear its violence towards language. In other words, Kent's enormous power of criticism, backed up by his disguise, means that he can stretch the limits of language, prosodically, but also topically, by means of his word coinage and metaphorical usage, to the point that the speech is almost impossible to follow in a first straightforward reading, even more for us, today, right? In order to expose the true nature of the servile servant, Kent brings his own language at the verge of unintelligibility. <laughs> this is only one of the many examples in which Renaissance authors use Hermogenes in the composition of boldly experimental styles to convey issues about power and truth. However, you may ask, if Hermogenes was indeed so influential and Shakespeare knew of his ideas, then why didn't we know about him until now? Well, there is a first answer to this question, which is that Hermogenes' work was never translated to modern languages until very late, in, very late in the 20th century. And therefore, most readers didn't have access to his theatres until quite recently. Before that, we only had it in Latin and Greek. 
However, I argue in my thesis that there is an even more significant reason for this neglect, that scholars did not consider the case that Hermogenes was so influential that he was not only disseminated in books by Hermogenes, as many as there were. Instead, his theory was learned through a wider body of influential Renaissance sources, which explained his theory in detail, discussed it, and connected it to poetry. When examining the English reception of Hermogenes in light of these wider sources, I saw a different story, that Hermogenes' work was standardly and widely owned and read by scholars, educators, and poets, and widely integrated in institutional education. Crucially, second-hand sources that disseminated his ideas had, like Wheeler Couch's anthology, a remarkable international circulation and were, by its most part, written in the period's lingua franca, which by then was not English, but Latin. Indeed, we have typically neglected that some of the most influential literary works of the Renaissance were composed in Latin, a language which was, which was standardly taught at school and university, informing what Shakespeare, Shakespeare famously and apologetically called his, and I quote him, small Latin and less Greek, signposting that he and the authors of his time typically had knowledge of both languages, more Latin, but also of Greek. It is no strange then that Latin was the language in which many of the authors of the period encountered Hermogenes, encounter, encountered Hermogenes theory in translation for the first time, and that these works were not printed in England, but in the most important European presses under the supervision of the period's leading scholars. For example, one of the chapters of my thesis demonstrated that when adopting the ideas of reproof, such as vehemence and asperity for satire and dissent, English Renaissance authors frequently look into the most important works of literary history history and criticism of the time, especially the work that you can see here in the top left corner, uh, Julius Caesar Scaliger's Poetiques Libri Septem, which was a great advocate of Hermogenes and used him to explain the styles of the classical satirists, so Perseus, Juvenal, and Horace. He thus strongly influenced the harsh styles of Renaissance writers, and this is another case of a book's, of, of a book's dissemination through another person's book. In this sense, Hermogenes case is quite fascinating. He's one of these incredibly disseminating authors who, for a variety of reasons, has not made it to a mainstream of 20th century canon of classical works on literary theory. He did not have a Grierson or an Eliot to resurrect him, or at least not until now. <laughs> However, his influence over the mixed, ingenious, experimental, and dissenting poetics of the Renaissance was to have a maybe invisible but equally driving afterlife thanks to later authors such as Parra, who quickly recognized the enactment of such stylistic principles in the most influential Renaissance writings. Here we get to the end. Verso Blanco, Blank Press. Nicanor Parra translated King Lear with his titled Rey and Lear, Rey y Mendigo, and I have here. As you can see, I, my drawing is, is fairly good. Uh, so he translated King Lear uh, when he was 78 years old. He composed it under, under commission of the British Council, the British Chilean Institute, and Chile's Ministry of Education 45 years after his trip to Oxford. For this, he did intensive research, including a trip to the US where he studied the place Folion Cuartos alongside modern English editions such as the Arden and the New Bariorum, and at least 11 translations of the play to Spanish. His final version, composed under the principles of his anti-poetry was staged in 1992 and published more than 10 years after in 2004, of course, under the name of Nicanor Parra rather than William Shakespeare. And bear in mind that this is also a university press, right? Universidad de Portales. Um, I was born to translate King Lear, Parra recognized in an interview with Maria de la Luz Hurtado. However, he pointed out that this was not love at first sight, since he recognized he quite struggled the first time he approached the play in Aguilar's Spanish version. In this same interview, he explained that translating Shakespeare involved not focusing on the anecdote, characters, or psychological construction, but on its language on itself, or what I might call its style. The true actors, he says, are not Gloucester or Edmund or Lear himself, but words. Focusing on the play fascinating language, he argued, he further argued, involved crucial engagement with his blank verse, which he presented as a fundamental contact point with his own anti-poetry. I'm gonna quote his sayings here. My own anti-poems use this type of blank 
verse. I've been asked for a long time, what is an anti-poem? And the most repeated answer I've given without realizing what, what I was indeed saying is that an anti-poem is nothing but a Shakespearean parliament and a dramatic parliament, we might have to add, is a Shakespearean blank verse. It is an endecasyllable that expands and shortens, that oscillates in between the academy, the street and the market. I have been working with this form from immemorial times, it's quite exaggerated, it's also quite old. Uh, I have come to combine verse of 11 syllables with one of one syllable and verses with prose. I thought that that was a great invention of mine, but the Elizabethans already knew these methods and Shakespeare uses in King Lear, where a great percentage of the work is written in prose without the reader being able to distinguish which are verses and which are prose. So imagine me like after reading Hermogenes reading things like this, I was like, oh my God. This is incredible. This was reading Renaissance theoricians talking about uh, about prosody, right? Barra probably did not read Hermogenes. Nevertheless, he picked the Hermogenian aspects of Shakespeare's verse to define his own anti-poetry with striking precision. He did not only remark the compelling flexibility and metrical irregularity of his blank verse, but also the obscurity of its idiomatic phrasing, all attributes of the ideas of reproof, especially vehemence. And I quote him again, Shakespeare's language is obscure, enigmatic and civilian, full of black holes, terribly synthetic and occasionally florid at the same time, difficult to understand. Shakespeare is quite idiomatic and therefore you should forget to translate him word after word. End of quote. Parra incorporated these principles throughout his translation of Lear. Let's look, for example, at Kent's Parliament in Parra's Chilean version. I'm going to read it now. Por granuja, por pícaro, por tragasobras, despreciable, engreído, miserable, eres un delator, un hijo de puta, presumido, rastrero, salamero, sangre de horchata, arribista, cobarde, caballero nonato de 50 libras, holgazán insolente, cuya hacienda cae en una maleta, tres tristes trajes al año, patas hediondas, empañador de espejos, sí, la calle experto en genuflexiones, pero que no es más que un engendro ruin, cabrón, hijo y nieto de perra desclasada, te daré una paliza hasta hacerte chillar si te atreves a negar una sílaba de tu currículum. That's Parra's verse. Parra brings back Kent's parliament into verse, expose, exposing it as broken prosody, thus showing the metrical configuration of Kent's apparently prosaic speech. He even fulfills his promise of having a one-syllable verse, C, yes, and emphasizes the conversational, outraged flow of Kent's speech, speech, the illusion that Kent is coining all of these words, words in the spur of the moment. In presenting its configuration as verse rather than prose, Parra enacts what he thinks is a crucial aspect of his own anti-poetry, his combination of the high and the low, the metrical regularity of the academia with the conversational fluctuations of the market, the elite uh, culture of Shakespeare with the idioms of Chilean popular language, what Parra called an oralidad metrica, a metrical orality. A mixture that Hermogenes and his Renaissance followers thought as constituent to the most forceful and skilled styles. Parra's mixed parliament is consistent with the insults he picks for Oswald. Rather than focusing on the character's low social status, Parra's Kent presents him more subtly as a social climber. He is a hijo y nieto de perra desclasada, rather than bastarda, which would have been the straightforward translation, un delator, una revista, un salamero. Oswald's curriculum spoken in a Chilean register is perhaps more ambiguous style inclining towards asperity, a mixed parliament which Kent, in disguise, could have uttered if more interested on in keeping his identity secret. So, could and should Parra's anti-poetic verse composed in Chile in the 20th century be interpreted from the lens of Hermogen's theory of stylistic descent, composing Greek and in Greece and actually in modern day Turkey, in the second century AD, a very good friend of my Pavan uh, pointed out in a conversation we had about this, uh, one of these typical problems that the classicist and the early modernist faces when trying to convey the relevance of their work. When you work with contemporary material or contemporary literature, it is assumed that these works are relevant today, no matter what they are about. However, when you work with something that is some centuries old, it seems that you need to justify your choices as if some texts could lose their currency entirely. 
Instead, reading a battle from Shakespeare and Hermogenes, I think, shows how the past illuminates the present, how contemporary experimental poetics are unintelligible without reference to their sources and most important models. Hermogenes theory has, I think, the potential of interrogating crucial aspects of Shakespeare's and Barra's dissenting poetics, such as the relationships between style and power, or of truth and formal experimentation. Barra selectively picks on Hermogenian traits of the Renaissance tradition, and by doing so, he shows the currency of Hermogenes as a literary theorist. And by this, I want to tell you, go and read Hermogenes, because <laughs> it's really cool. And we can talk more about his ideas later if you have doubt on, on any of the other ideas. So Shakespeare's blank verse, as seen from Parra's eye, this is El Verco Bla Verso Blanco Shakespeareano, works as a conceptual unit that justifies the historical plausibility of reading these three authors together. This works not only on the basis of the robust and erudite readings that both authors made of the tradition, but on the incredible dissemination of Hermogenes Shakespeare and also finally Parra. Who is, who is actually taught at Oxford currently and also is an honorary fellow over there. So things go back. In this sense, by, by telling the story of the early modern receptions of Hermogenes and how difficult it has been to recover them, I would like to signpost the importance of thinking of poets as readers. In Chile, we seem to be still quite unaware of the books where our authors and ourselves have read our classics, books that, uh, like, Quiller Count's anthology have a weight and a size and also include other texts such as notes and a prologue which convey specific ideas of why these works need readership and why they are considered important. This is a subject uh, which book history and classical reception studies have vigorously addressed here in the UK and which have prompted the archival conditions that made my research on Hermogenes possible. For example, what if we put hands on Paras copy of the Oxford Book of, Eng of, Oxford book of English verse? Would there would be any notes or illuminating details that would tell us some more these gestational moments of the anti-poetry. So in suggesting the reading of this anthology, Nicanor Parra's found poem, and I would like to finish with this idea, especially signals the importance of the books where we encountered a literary work for the first time, the invisible but powerful imprint left by those first readings in our understanding of this work's program, notion of authorhood and place in the literary history. And we still have exciting work to do in studying this reception in Chile. That will be it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Javiera. That was fascinating. Let me just uh, stop sharing the screen so that we can see you again. Thank you so, so much. That was fantastic. You're blown away, I think, by, by so much information. Oh, maybe yeah. some of the questions might want to go back perhaps to a few of these of comments. Course. I love the way that, that you um, analyzed Kent's speech and kind of figured out how Barra uh, pinpoints that idea of going back to the verse and how Kent is kind of losing, you know, losing his, his, um, his costume as he, yeah, as he, as speaks. he, as he speaks, yeah. which is fantastic. Um, Perhaps we might start. So this is a time for questions, right? So if you have any questions, I'm 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 reading over here, and I also have the the YouTube channel um, comments. Um, but perhaps uh, Javiera, you might want to talk us through a little bit how you came upon this topic, and uh, because I think it's, I mean, one of the things that's fascinating about. Um, this idea of of the reader, the reader and the materiality of the book is is thinking about the circulation of actual books, right? And thinking through who gets to be in the canon. And sometimes it's a choice. Sometimes it's kind of luck, um, yeah. as in as in you know, Barra happened upon. He found these things presumably, um, and it's one of the questions I ask in my Shakespeare course. Why Shakespeare? Why are we reading? Why are we still reading Shakespeare, right? And how do we read Shakespeare? How did it, how did it happen that we're reading Shakespeare instead of Hermogenes, for instance? Um, so maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you how you came upon your topic. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, uh, I'll I'll try to answer two questions. So first of all, I think that what is quite crucial is that I heard about Hermogenes for the first time not in England but in Chile, ah. right? Uh, so I did two masters. I did a master at the Universidad de Chile first, and then I uh, and then I moved to England to do my stu uh, my studies in English literature. And when I was at Universidad de Chile, I had like the lack of reading 
books at the same time. And I think that book history is all about recognizing that, that we are not only reading one book, but we're reading all these networks of books at the same time. So I was having this course on uh, obscurity and contemporary poetry with Felipe Cassen. So reading a lot of authors that had been influenced by Parra. And then at the same time I was reading all these authors, I had a course uh, with Sarisa Carneiro, who's uh, teaching at Universidad, Universidad Católica now, and, uh, and a teacher that's called Joao Adolfo Hansen, who's also brilliant. And they did this course on uh, rhetoric and poetry in 16th and 17th centuries, right? So when I started reading about poetry, it was like, there is a connection here that I'm not really grasping, but there's something here that I might want to explore. And this was the first time when I heard our Hermogenes, right? So, um, yeah, I think that that's why also this chat is kind of important for me because it means that it means that coming back to, uh, after I got that information, after I've done this research, I come back to see how that tells me about, about my own kind of the tradition, literary tradition of my own country. What is really interesting as well is that it's precisely this being outside the Anglophone uh, academia, what gave me a real insight, uh, the insight on this topic that would allow me to do a contribution uh, in, to English literary studies, right? Uh, and in that sense, uh, I think everything I've been talking about today, so Parra as a Spanish speaker reading English poetry, really touches me because I've lived myself the kind of uh, benefits and also limitations of uh, being a Spanish speaker uh, in, uh, an, in Anglophone scholarship and doing uh, scholarship in English uh, when I'm a Spanish speaker. So that's the story about Hermogenes. Um, and then, yeah, uh, I think that one of the most challenging things about uh, studying Hermogenes was precisely to think why didn't he make that to the current literary canon? Mm -hmm. Like, why don't we know about him if he was so read in the Renaissance? And that was really challenging. I had a, a plenty, I think it's a combination of, of, uh, of factors. Uh, one of them, of course, as I said in the presentation is that he wasn't translated. The other one is that there were more sources because when someone's really influential, for example, imagine, I don't know how it happened in, uh, in, in your studies in English, but when I studied literature in, in Hispanic American poetry and Spanish poetry, one of the authors we would read definitely in our course of literary theory was uh, Derrida. Very complex, none of us understood a word of it, <laughs> but we knew the guy existed and that he was really, really important to our under current understandings of literature, right? Uh, but then I would never go around quoting Derrida, right? Or discussing Derrida <laughs> opening. So this is a bit, well, Hermogenes is easier than Derrida, uh, but this is a bit of what happened with him in the time. Like there were no explicit discussions of his theory that would say, oh, this guy was really read. Right. So that was that that made things really difficult to trace. But then that's why the work in book history made things uh, was so important because it was only by tracing who was owning these books, whether it was in the university curricula and who was reading them, what gave me the actual clues of what was the scale of the readership of Hermogenes. Uh, there might be other reasons, of course, like Hermogenes, as you saw, was quite disruptive in his understanding of form. So quoting Hermogenes or ascribing to his theories too much could have been a little bit disruptive in the time, which is one of the other reasons why all of uh, the authors of the time name him or name drop him, but nobody yeah. really discusses his theory. Um, so that sort of leads me to, to another question, which is because you mentioned that it, there are limitations and kind of bonuses to coming from another culture, another language um, to, to studying English literature. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe you, you studied uh, Letras Hispanicas. And that's kind of interesting that you switched into um, English. So maybe you'd like to address that. But also I'm, I'm very interested and I think our 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 students are also very interested in, because there's a sense, right, that you that you sort of you can't do this, right? You you coming you're coming from another culture. How on earth are you going to be studying Shakespeare or Hermogenes or anything? It, it's daunting. So, um, what are the pluses of coming maybe from another language or another culture? What is it that you are Perhaps because you're not in the culture, you have maybe an Definitely. outside perspective. Uh, if I had, if I had been trained in uh, in the UK here in London, I wouldn't have come up with the topic of my research. It's as simple as that. Like <laughs> I found the kind of critical tools, and also my background was what led me to um, 
to the topics, uh, to, to finally kind of contributing to uh, English studies. I know it's quite daunting. Uh, I have lived that myself, but I think that there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to make a contribution on your own. And I think that coming from abroad is a real strength. Also because it gives you, I like, I thought I thought at some point I was going to become bilingual when I arrived here. That was my that was my uh, that that was my hope, right? That at some point I was going to be dreaming every day in English and and this sort of thing. And that never happened. Like I've always <laughs> I've always been like, well, I read. Well, I think I told you before that I read uh, all the English poets I'm working with in the thesis. I read them first in translation. I didn't read them in English, right? And I think that writing the thesis has been a process of working with a language that is always really conscious of itself. And that has been difficult, but I think that that has been a real strength too. Uh, and also, of course, when you're thinking about the, the literature of Shakespeare and his contemporaries, it's a literature that was European. It wasn't English, right? Um, the, the, the circulation of books of poetics was, uh, was international. And that's how we need to understand the reception of Hermotinus in connection with the most important literary works of the time. So let's say Gongora. Gongora can be read uh, with John Donne and Shakespeare because they were kind of thinking styles in the very same similar terms. So that was a real strength when I came to study English because I had a, that knowledge, that wider knowledge of the, of the literary tradition too. Uh, but yeah, do it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, go for it. And so you came into, so you, you, you came upon the interest um, of, so you switched at some point between Spanish and English. English. I think that the uh, what led me there, first of all, was taste. I loved English poetry. So I really enjoyed those poems. I really enjoyed John Donne's poetry. So you probably read The Flea, like all these poems are ah. fantastic. <laughs> are really, really cool, really ironic, really, really funny, really witty. I love them. Uh, but then also I think was this kind of obsession over it, understanding the traditions that were shaping the different authors' literary practice. So all of my research before I started doing anything with Hermogenes was on contemporary Latin American right. poetry. Completely different, right? But then in thinking about Parra and then studying rhetoric, I started understanding that these guys were reading earlier poetry, for example, Shakespeare. And then when you go to Shakespeare and there's things you don't understand, you go even yeah. more into the past. And that's what happened to me. I started like going into the past to trace these different these different traditions who were they talking to when they were write, writing in a in a specific way and i love that you're bringing para up in, in within the english speaking works i think para is brilliant and it's always you know when you think of Chile, it's, it's usually uh, neruda and mistral and i love kind of the uh, para, is, <laughs> para is really cool for those who are in england uh there's this well there's different translations there's some authorized translations and some unauthorized translations because Parra was really picky about who was translating his work, right? And this is the authorized one. Um, and it's really cool. It's called Anti-Poems, How to Look Better and Feel Great. Uh, and it's really cool to, yeah, it's really cool to <laughs> have it on its own. poetry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's going to heal, yeah. heal you. Um, so yeah, buy it. It's really, really cool. It's cool stuff. Uh, and it's really entertaining poetry as well. You just read it in one go. Uh, yeah, we'll read that then. Yeah. So I'm going to read some of the questions that we're receiving from the audience. This is Josefina Venegas. Hello, Josefina. Um, hello from London. Thank you so much for such an interesting talk. Javiera, you talked a little bit about mixture. Could you please say a little bit more, uh, especially in relation to Parra? Okay, so probably one of the most groundbreaking ideas uh, of Hermogenes about form is that all the ideas of style had to be mixed, right? Uh, and this was quite groundbreaking at the time and was actually kind of rediscovered by different literary theorists who integrate this into literary criticism. So when thinking about epic, for example, Torquato Tasso used Hermogenes a lot. When thinking about tragic comedy, Batista Guarini used Hermogenes a lot. He said, well, this is not Aristotle who we should be using here, but this is Hermogenes, right? So, uh, yeah, once I uh, once I discovered Hermogenes, I realized that his theory of mixture was being used elsewhere to talk about literature, but also, for example, in the case um, um, uh, there's another Greek uh, English author that uses it to think about uh, the mixture of English poetry, of English language as such. So English goes and mixes different languages coming from different uh, coming from different parts of the globe, right? So it was quite 
open thinking about mixture. It wasn't really specific. So it gave open the door to different understandings of how this mixture had to happen. If it was a mixture of genres, if it was a mixture of styles, if it was a mixture of, of, of different prosody. And I think that uh, I, I might have to develop this thing in regards to Parra, but I think that what is quite important is that Parra, Parra's anti-poetry is inclusive, right? Um, he wants, he doesn't say, oh, I just want to do free verse. No, he takes verse and he takes the academic tradition and says, we need to work this out and to introduce the conversational uh, elements we want in our poetry within verse to discover this kind of stock of uh, of the of, of how uh, the Spanish language works uh, by the means of verse. So this idea of mixing the academy and the and, and the market uh, is really, really present in Parra's poetry. Uh, and he actually at some point defined his own anti-poetry as uh, delirious eclecticism, right? As bringing all these materials together. And in this sense, it's quite important when thinking about reception studies that these are also mixed, right? By doing this presentation, I don't claim that Shakespeare is the only source of Shakespeare's, of Parra's poetry, but then that is a complicated factor that gives us a different and unique insight of how his uh, his his poetry is at work. I hope that this starts right. Thank you. And we have another question from another former student. It's so lovely to see so many um, familiar names, let's put it. So Rocio Ibanez. Rocio says, hi, I was just wondering, do you think that Barra's anti-poems use mostly only one of the types of insults that you mentioned that uh, Hermogenes described, or do you think he used a mixture of both? Because if we think about some anti-poems, sometimes Parra uses the usted that may show mm. some respect, but then includes a strong insult or plainly compares the poet and death and treats them as equals. So it seems like there is always a power struggle that no one seems to win. Oh, this is super cool. Thank mm. you so much for this question. I absolutely agree with your reading uh, with your reading of the two styles of reproof. Uh, I gave, uh, just because of matters of time, I gave uh, an, an, uh, an example that was pretty much aligned to the style of vehemence. In, I wouldn't say in its pure form because it would never have a pure form of vehemence. And this is really important about Hermogenes' understanding of style. He never believes that there's going to be a single form using purity, right? most of the time what you will have is a negotiation between forms. So for example, if we go back to Death Be No Proud by Don, uh, the poem starts with saying Death Be No Proud, so implying a, st a style of vehemence, but then fluctuates in between vehemence and asperity. And this always seemed to be a negotiation between the two. So what we would use the Hermogenes guidelines for is to actually read these negotiations within single poems, not to say, oh, this is asperity or this is vehemence. It's actually to understand how this, uh, this style is at work. And I think that what's quite interesting about this understanding of form is that it leads us to an understanding of language in which style is not a product, but it's something that is being produced. That is something that language does uh, and is negotiating all the time. So thank you very much for, for your question. I find uh, I might have to see those poems afterwards. I think it's fascinating. Um, and then we have a sort of, I think it's a comment question <clears throat> via um, YouTube from Daniel Gonzalez. Hello, Daniel. Uh, he says, when you read that quote from King Lear, it reminded me of Cervantes' description of Don Quixote. And that reminded me of the moment when Don Quixote's library is purged and among the few spared books, there was La Raucana. And then he says, Parra was really picky on who translated his words. I'm really surprised about this. <laughs> no. um, I don't know if you have any Yeah, no, on. it's no, no, no. It's really, really a good point and comment. What, uh, what you're showing here is that uh, mm -hmm. the, the literature that was written in the 16th and 17th centuries was not only European, also in Latin America. Uh, you had works written in the same fashion. So you had La Raucana, but then you had also Cervantes, who is, of course, influenced by Hermogenes as well. And this has been studied by a leader, leading scholar in, in Spain who's called uh, Luisa López Grijera. She, like, ages ago, did a, wrote a paper saying Cervantes was reading Hermogenes. Like, uh, you should check out that, right? So, yeah, really, really nice commentary. Basically, uh, there's a shared culture between these countries, not only Europe, but also Latin America at the time, the colonies, uh, that needs to be further studied in connection, I think. That's amazing. There's a lot of 
um, potential then to your, yeah, to your yeah. topic. And we have one more question, Lucas. Hello, Lucas. Thank you so much, says Lucas, for the presentation. I find the found books approach to the transmission of ideas and style to be extremely fascinating. Do you have any bibliographical recommendations to expand on this topic? And are you aware of any other research that utilizes this framework? And um, if Javier, if you don't have anything here, maybe you can you can give us now your um, email address. And maybe if anyone wants to continue yeah, the conversation, yeah, yeah, I, I I'm I'm happy to I'm happy to send around sources uh, if you want. Uh, well, what I've been pretty much uh, building on uh, for this research was in all the development on neo Latin studies that has been happening in the last time. So of thinking that. Latin was the major language of uh, intellectual culture in the Renaissance, right? So there has been a lot of uh, book history being uh, being made, but reception studies is huge and it's being kind of uh, it's being kind of conducted in all different areas, not only for Renaissance studies. So I'm really happy to be in touch and send some of the material I have. Uh, yeah, maybe you can write down your address there um, so maybe. that we have it on the chat. Mm. A very long yes, institutional okay. email. Oh, so how do I do? Oh, uh, no, no, I need uh, is it all super? super? Mm. Which one? The okay. one. maybe you can. No, let's do no. this. Let's do the old fashioned writing of. I think I think I I, I typed my email it? in the in the presentation, right? But um. I do have uh, my computer changed between Spanish and English, and it changed everything. It's really, it's really annoying. I think after this, if we have no more questions, we're going to release Javiera um, and thank her for this wonderful presentation. So this is um, oh, extensión letras. Thank de... you. <laughs> thank you so much. But if not, thank you so much. Ben. This is the. Old fashioned way. The old fashioned way. But there, um, Blenny uh, from Extension um, quickly gave us the, the address. So thank you so much. I'm going to give a special thanks to Blenny for this, for organizing yeah, um, you, the event. Javiera, you were wonderful. This is fantastic and fascinating. And I hope it has inspired our students and former students and anyone who wants to do a little bit more research on Hermogenes. I certainly am going to go read his. Please this do, text please and see and find more connections. And I think I'm going to be teaching. Um, I'm including be... him, yes, please. <laughs> I mean, I think in theory it fits in very nicely. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, I've, I've taught King Lear and I have not made that connection. So I think mm -hmm. that definitely Brilliant. is going in. So thank you so much. And you're getting some thank yous over there as well from students and friends. So thank you so much for everything. And I don't know if you want to add anything else. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Thank you, Lenny, uh, for everything. Uh, and thank you to all the audience uh, for having me here. Hope this has been nice. And you'll see Javiera um, soon, I think, in Chile. So yeah, she, yeah, if you want to talk to her soon. in person. Yeah, um, yeah. Happy to meet anyone or whatever. Uh, there's my email, my contact, and I'm going to be in Chile in August. So see you there. Thank you so much, everyone. And see you soon.